In this short video, we're going to be discussing X-ray absorption and how we can use this in creating filters to improve the quality of the radiation in our diffractometers. So in the first video about generating radiation, we talked about these sealed X-ray tubes and how they have beryllium windows. These beryllium windows act to seal the vacuum inside the tube to seal the tube and also to allow the escape of some X-rays so that we can use them in our experiments. Over time, beryllium will oxidize to beryllium oxide. We tend to get these white crystals forming upon the windows. These are water soluble, water permeable, so water can get in um, to the X-ray tube, we get a loss of vacuum, and also water and high voltages tend to be a bad idea. So why do we choose beryllium? It's an expensive metal, it's increasingly hard to get hold of, so why do X-ray tubes have beryllium? Well, to answer that question, we have to talk about how X-rays interact with matter. X-rays are partially transmitted, partially tra absorbed by matter. There are two processes that contribute to this absorption. Um, the true absorption, electronic transitions within the atoms of the material, and X-ray scattering, uh, which causes a, a loss of intensity in the transmitted beam. There are various factors that affect absorption. The thickness of the material and its density are, are, the, are two key factors. Also the chemical composition, things like lead, um, will absorb a lot more than beryllium. And finally the wavelength of the uh, radiation, the energy of the radiation, will also have an impact. And we see this uh, schematically drawn here, where the incident beam I0 uh, is far more intense than the transmitted beam IT, as a result of absorption and scattering events in our sample. We'll come back to talk about scattering in later um, videos, but for light elements, for now it's enough to say that X-ray scattering is not a significant factor here. For a homogeneous material, a fractional decrease in the intensity is proportional to the distance traveled to the, to the thickness of the material element. And so we can see that drawn schematically here, that the change in the intensity is going to be proportional to the thickness of the material. And this gives rise to the linear absorption coefficient, which is given as simply mu. And this depends on the substance, its density, and also the wavelength of the X-rays. Going through the uh, derivation of this, we arrive at the equation IT, the transmitted beam intensity, is equal to I0, the incident beam intensity, times the exponential minus mu x, where x is the sample thickness. The linear absorption coefficient is proportional to density rho. So the linear absorption coefficient depends on the physical state of the material, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, in other words. And that gives rise then to the mass absorption coefficient mu m. And this can be written uh, down here as it equals i0 exponential minus mu m rho x, where rho is the density and x is the sample thickness. So this mass absorption coefficient is independent of density and then therefore of physical state, and it's a constant of the material with the units cm squared over grams. Fortunately for us, um, most, uh, most elements have uh, had these values tabulated, so we can just look up the mass absorption coefficients for given materials with given uh, radiation types. So in our case, we're talking about beryllium. So we can look up the values for beryllium. The mass absorption coefficient is 1.11 cm squared over g for copper careful radiation. And also Wikipedia will tell us that the density of beryllium is 1.85 grams per cubic centimeter. So what does all this mean? Well, if our beryllium window was one millimeter thick, so x equals 0.1, what would be the intensity of the transmitted beam IT? Well, we can substitute the values into our equation here. IT equals I0 e to the minus mu m rho x. So we know that mu m is 1.11. We know that the density rho is 1.85. And we're told that the thickness is 0.1 centimeters. We take the incident beam intensity as being 100, 100% in other words, and we can calculate the transmitted beam intensity, therefore, to be 
81.4%. So 81.4% of our X-ray photons would be transmitted through this beryllium window of one millimeter thickness. So the beryllium window would only be absorbing uh, a little over 19.5%, 18.5%. In actual fact, the beryllium windows used in the seaward X-ray tubes are actually only an eighth of a micron thick, so they're much, much thinner than this. And that means, if you were to perform the calculation with the correct values, you would see that the transmitted beam intensity is almost 100%. It's effectively 100%. Uh, and so that's why beryllium is used, uh, because it lets through all of the X-rays that are striking those windows. As we say, these mu m values have been tabulated for elements of various different wavelengths, uh, the common wavelengths that we use in, in uh, X ray laboratories. Um, for a compound, uh, the mass absorption coefficient, mu m, is determined by the weighted mass fraction of the mass absorption coefficients of each element. You can see that written schematically here. What that means, well, uh, if we take the example of our beryllium windows degrading to beryllium oxide, well, we can calculate the mass absorption coefficient for beryllium oxide. The relative atomic, atomic mass of beryllium oxide is 25.01. So for copper k alpha radiation, again, we can look up the mass absorption coefficients for beryllium 1.11, we've seen already. And for oxygen, um, the mass absorption coefficient is 11.5. So if we then work out the weighted mass fractions for beryllium, it's the relative atomic mass of beryllium 9.01 over the relative atomic mass for beryllium oxide, 25.01. So the weighted mass fraction for beryllium is 0 0.36. Similarly, the weighted mass fraction for the oxygen is 0 0.64. So our mu m for beryllium oxide is equal to the weighted mass fraction for beryllium multiplied by the mass absorption coefficient for beryllium plus the weighted mass fraction of oxygen multiplied by the uh, mass absorption coefficient of oxygen. So 0 0.36 multiplied by 1.11 plus 0 0.64 times 11.5, which gives us 7.76 uh, cm squared of grams. So you can see that beryllium oxide is significantly more absorbing uh, than the beryllium alone would be. So we would see this possibly as a reduction in the intensity of our transmitted beam. We could also look at this another way uh, and ask what thickness of foil we would need in order to attenuate a uh, copper X-ray beam by 50%. The trick here is to note that IT over I0 is going to be um, 0 0.5. So we're talking IT being 50, I0 being 100, so 50 by 100 is going to be 0 0.5. And that's equal to the EXP minus 1.11 times 1.85 times x, the thickness. And what we're looking for now is this thickness x. So we can rearrange this equation so that the natural log of 0 0.5 is equal to minus 2.054 times the thickness x. And again, we can rearrange that for x. And we can see that it gives the value 0 0.337 centimeters. So if we had a piece of beryllium that was 3.37 uh, millimeters thick, we would be able to attenuate our copper X-ray beam by 50%, so cut its intensity in half. This principle is also the basis of radiography, as used in medicine and in uh, non-destructive testing materials. In these examples, you would use um, high energy because you need high transmission. You need to get the, the, the X-rays through the specimen, through the person, um, onto some sort of detector, so tend to use high energy, 70 kilovolts or higher tungsten tubes. The principle is to make use of the different mass absorption coefficients and material densities to get contrast in imaging. So we see here some cracks in metal um, castings, maybe you see some pores um, in the left-hand image, and in the right-hand image we see the example of airport security, so we check in someone's suitcase to see what's inside. <clears throat> One thing we've mentioned before is that there's a dependency on wavelength. What happens is that we see sharp discontinuities in mass absorption coefficients as a function of wavelength. And you can see that schematically for nickel metal down here to the bottom right. There's an equation for this mu m equals some constant k. 
times by the cube of the uh, wavelength times the cube of the atomic number. These discontinuities are referred to as absorption edges. If we look at the physical origin of these absorption edges, well, if we start from the uh, high wavelength, low energy m, on the right of the graph, we can note that the absorption energy is decreasing with decreasing wavelength. So that means as the photons are increasing in energy, we get reduced scattering. And so mu m decreases with lambda. Then we get to some sort of edge where there's a big step jump in the mass absorption coefficient. And this is where the X-ray photons have sufficient energy to knock out a core shell electron from an atom. So this is a true absorption process. In this case, mu m is increasing rapidly at the absorption edge. Once we get below the absorption edge, our X-ray photons still have enough energy to knock out core shell electrons. But the shorter wavelengths are higher energy, so they're also more penetrating. So again, we get reduced scattering. And so we see again that mu m starts to decrease with wavelength. Electron transitions from higher shells will fill the core hole with the emission of X-ray photons at characteristic wavelengths. And this is the process that we know as fluorescent radiation. For how, how might this be useful? Well, for diffraction experiments, uh, we need monochromatic radiation, or at least we would like it. Um, it would make our lives a lot easier. So we want to use characteristic radiation. In the video on generating radiation, we looked at uh, copper X-ray tubes and how we get both K-alpha radiation and K-beta radiation. You know, alpha average wavelength 1.5418 angstroms and copper K-alpha uh, sorry, copper K beta 1.3922 angstroms. The copper K alpha is much more intense, so we want to keep this, but ideally we'd like to get rid of the K beta. So, to filter out the unwanted radiation, the K beta, we need to use a filter. Um, and we need to use a material that has an absorption edge lying to the short wavelength side of the K alpha. So, we are not affecting the K alpha radiation too much. But then suddenly, at lower wavelengths, we start to absorb a lot more of the radiation. For copper X-ray tubes, we would generally use a nickel filter for this. Um, and in, in, as a general rule, if your, your X-ray source has an atomic number of around about 30, you would generally use a filter uh, of a material with an atomic number of one less. So for copper, we use a nickel. So we can see the effect that this would have here. Uh, on the left-hand diagram, we can see our um, uh, copper X-ray um, spectrum overlaid with the nickel metal foil absorption edge. And you can note that the nickel absorption edge is lying in between K-beta and K-alpha. And the absorption is much greater for the K-beta than for the wavelengths where K-alpha occurs. And so in the right-hand image, we can see the result of using this nickel filter. It looks like we have removed the K beta and we've got a nice clean K alpha. We need to be careful about this because we haven't removed it at all. It's just suppressed. Um, so it may well be that you still see K beta radiation and you always need to be aware of that. We haven't removed it, we've suppressed it. So we've suppressed the unwanted characters radiation, the K beta. And we've also suppressed the continuous radiation but we also have to bear in mind that we've, if, uh, we've quite significantly reduced the K-alpha radiation. So we've got a transmitted beam which is cleaner, it has a much um, more pure K-alpha um, peak, but we may still have some K-beta there. Um, the filtering is not perfect. We, we still maybe have a K-alpha to K-beta ratio of 1 to 500 instead of 1 to 5. So the K-beta peak may still be there, but there is some hope. Other applications, well, um, here we see um, a picture of a briefcase um, that's going through airport security. Uh, and we're looking here at a conventional X-ray image. So denser things appear darker, um, lighter things uh, appear lighter. And it's hard to see um, what's going on in here. It looks like a pretty normal, straightforward briefcase. And you see some clips and scissors and so on. If we were to take an X-ray absorption image, we see something very heavy 
um, standing out very clearly in the centre of the diagram. And this happens to be a lead azide bond detonator. So what we saw there was that the conventional X-ray image makes use of the density and the scattering contrast, and it's hard to see anything in isolation. But with the X-ray absorption imaging, well, what we would do actually would be to compare two images, one taken just above the absorption edge, where the mass absorption coefficient of lead is very small, so there would be little contrast. And then we would take one just below the lead absorption edge, and so the mass absorption coefficient for lead would now be large, and there would be high contrast, because the lead would be absorbing well. So what we're doing is chemically differentiating the lead azide according to the characteristic absorption edge uh, of the lead. And so we can see the lead azide bomb detonator quite easily in isolation. So hopefully this has given you an overview of X-ray absorption and how we use it in X-ray diffraction and in other applications as well.